Okay, so now we are looking at we're continuing continuing to look at adjoints and Kramer's rule. Okay. Uh, we defined what the adjoint was. We found that we multiply the adjoint by a times the adjoint to get the determinant of a. Now we find really the reason we the reason we used the reason we invented that formula, the reason we the reason we stated this theorem, figured out it made this calculation that a times the adjoint is determinant of a. Is now you divide both sides of that by the determinant of a. The determinant of a is just a number, and you get that the inverse of a equals one over the determinant of a times the adjoint of a. Okay. You take this. You take this equation, divide throughout by the determinant of a, and of course you'll get a times one over the determinant of a times mm, times the adjoint of a, because it's just just determinant of, determinant of a or one over determinant of a. They're just it's just a scalar, so it can come in any place. Equals i, but this is really the definition of the inverse matrix, right? A times inverse matrix equals I. So that proves that the inverse matrix is equal to one of the term times the adjoint. Now, this is easily shown by rearranging the equation in fact 2.13. Well, although this result is useful theoretically, it is rubbish for computation because it's so hard to calculate the adjoint because you have to calculate a whole, you have to calculate n times n. You have to calculate n squared cofactors each cofactor being a determinant of an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix. That's a huge computation. So it's useful theoretically, but it's rubbish for computation. If you actually need to find the inverse, don't use this formula. Use Gauss reduction. Okay. Um, let me just remind you, the way you, the way you find an inverse using Gauss reduction is, well, the inverse, the inverse satisfies this equation, right? Okay. But this is almost exactly the same as if we had this equation, okay? We know exactly how to solve this. You Gauss reduce this, you Gauss reduce until this A becomes in row echelon form or becomes identity. And then you find, if you reduce it until it becomes identity, effectively what you've done is you've, sorry, you have this. Now if you reduce it until A becomes identity, you'll have got to this stage. Okay. Effectively, what you're doing in that case is multiplying both sides by the inverse, even though maybe you didn't know that. Of course, sometimes this A is not invertible, so you don't ever get to identity. You get something with a row of zeros. But if it is invertible, you, this is what you're doing. You're finding the inverse, effectively, of A minus 1. Unfortunately, you've got the, actually you're finding, you, you'll be finding the inverse times by this matrix, this vector B. So instead of using B there, let's instead of using, we'll, we'll use the identity matrix, right? But if this is going to be identity matrix, this x, okay, which we're finding, will be the will be the inverse. Okay? So when we reduce it, we end up finding that. So we end up finding the inverse. Okay? Concretely, what that means is to find the inverse of a matrix. Don't use this adjoint thing. That's a good thing for theorizing about inverses, but not a good thing for calculating. Suppose you want to find the inverse of the matrix. I'm just going to write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I offhand, I have no idea if that's an inverse or not. Never mind. OK. You, what you do is you write down, this is what your inverse is going to appear. Should need a bit more space than that, sorry. All right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Suppose you want to find the inverse of that. Here's the inverse where the inverse is going to appear. Equals, and then here we have identity matrix. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? So here we have the inverse with its entries. We don't know what they are yet. We're going to find them. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Now what you do is you Gauss reduce both sides of this. Okay? Just like when you're solving AX, you know, AX equals B. You Gauss reduce until this thing becomes identity. Okay? And when it becomes identity, this unknown thing here, A, B, C, D, E, F, will equal what it will be equal to, what you'll have here, because you'll be doing the same Gauss operations to the right-hand side, that, that what you have here will be the inverse, right? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so that's how you calculate that's how you calculate the inverse. This formula is just for theorizing about inverses. Okay, now we have Kramer's rule. If A is invertible and AX equals B, then the solution X oh, the solution X, so this uh, X1, X2, Xn transpose, that's just because they didn't want to write X equals X1, X2, Xn because they felt that would mess up the formatting because it's so tall. Anyway, if x equals b, then the solution x can be found by using xj as the determinant of aj over the determinant of a, where aj is the matrix A with its jth column replaced by b. Now, again, this is not a, not a nice, this is, this is not a nice way of finding the solution. You really should find the solution to this by Gauss reducing. But it's true that the solution is this. It's not nice to use this because this requires calculating the determinant of A, and then for every entry in X, so there's N entries, the determinant of AJ, AJ being A with its J column replaced by B. So you need to have to calculate N plus one determinants for this, and it's always much easier to just Gauss reduce. So I'm not going to bother with the explanation, which anyway is a tutorial problem, 